Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just, uh, we love you and we thank you for just another beautiful day. I uh, thank you for this church, for the people in it, God, and I pray that you would just motivate us to be more effective for you, God, to see the gifts and talents that you've given us, um, Lord, and I just pray that that if there's anything in this class that um, that was from you, that um, that you had intended for someone to hear, God, I pray that it would take deep root in their hearts, in their souls, and that it would bear fruit for you and for the well-being of those around them. God, we love you and praise things in your son's holy name. Amen. All right, so I think people may have been scared of this week coming coming to class. Um, any, I kind of wanted to just have, I do have some slides prepared, like I told you all. Has anybody taken what we've talked about and really applied it and decided on any, anything to dramatically different to do in your lives? And it's okay if you haven't. I realize everybody's crazy busy. Okay, because of this class? <laughs> yeah. Can you talk, tell me more about that conclusion? Like, what kind of stuff are you throwing away? Okay. So like truly, truly getting rid of waste. Like, okay. So for you, that was, that was a form of waste that you're getting rid of. Anything else? So what about the, uh, anybody think any more about the, the personal mission statements or different areas or roles in your life that, that we talked about? This morning. I know you all, it's, we're, we're talking about some things we discussed last week. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah. Did you take anything from that and and apply it or? Okay. Like what? Okay. Clutter. Any clutter. Okay. Has that opened you up to serve others like you kind of wanted? It has. Nice. That's somewhat impossible when your kids get a little older. <laughs> Mom always says it's like brushing your teeth while eating Oreos. <laughs> no, that's good, though. I mean, you know, that's what, you know, like we talked about in one of the weeks, the vast majority of all this is just figuring out how to create capacity, whether that's planned capacity or unplanned capacity just for the purpose of serving for sure anything else
No, I'm a huge fan of, yeah, yeah. Did anyone else um, define any specific missions that God had laid on your hearts? With the, we talked about the roles and missions, specific missions within your roles. Did anybody spend any more time on that after last week? It's okay if you didn't. Mm-hmm. And so I spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time at the missions praying for her. And sometimes it's frustrating because when I have other siblings who aren't making that same investment as her, but that just, you can get bogged down in the vain. Mm-hmm. But that reminder that this really is a mission of her. She's not a believer. Yeah. That's good. Anybody else? All right, I'll start jumping through some of these um, these slides that I have. Again, just what I didn't want this class to be was a list of things for you to do. Um, some of the books I recommended last week, the last few weeks, there are specifics in the book. Hey, what what apps can you use? What how do you approach email? These types of things. Um, I'm a much bigger fan of, of principle, of just of learning principle, of thinking about principle, and for those to be within the realm of each of you are Holy Spirit indwelt people, and that if if you understand and, and have a particular principle that you align with and agree with, then then I think there's a lot of decisions you can make that are good. Um, so that's kind of kind of what I wanted to talk about, but today I want to talk more about being effective. So we've, we've spent time talking about efficiency and, and eliminating waste and variation and all those types of things, um, but what does an effective person look like? There is a best-selling um, book. This is by no means a purely spiritual book on any level. Have you heard of this? Has anybody read it? You read it? So over 40 million copies sold, very famous book. If you're in any type of leadership, or basically I think everybody should read this book. There's one for teenagers too that we're making Abby read right now. Um, but, you know, I think anything like this, this is just a description of the world. Um, somebody who's written a book like this has said, hey, what works? And, you know, I'm a huge believer that um, that the Bible is clearly the the greatest text that's ever been written, that it is, that it is perfect, that it's um, God's word. Um, so generally anything like this that's real, that has worked for lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people is usually supported by scripture. <laughs> um, you know, like any good story in a movie, it's almost always a sacrificial story, like the story of Jesus, right? I mean, it's the same kind of mentality. So 
there are seven habits that, that he talks about. We're going to go through them kind of with a biblical lens today. Um, and they're public, private, and then renewal. So being proactive, beginning with the end in mind, putting things first, thinking win-win, seeking first to understood, then be understood, synergize, and then sharpening the saw. So um, I like being very blunt, as those of you who know me know that that's true. I'm a huge fan of Reformed theology. Um, I didn't grow up in the church. Um, to me, it's very clear that God is the primary stimulus of, of us, that he first interacted with us before we responded that my salvation is dependent upon him. I mean, I think that's very clearly taught in this church. Have you all ever heard the term frozen chosen? <clears throat> you haven't? Um, so having not grown up in the church, um, having been around basically secular workplaces my whole life, I get to see what the world thinks about Christians pretty, pretty frequently and pretty regularly. Um, this is a term from within the church that has been given largely to Presbyterians, uh, to Reformed Presbyterians, but this certainly aligns with Reformed Baptists as well. So people call Reformed Baptists, Reformed Presbyterians, the frozen chosen. Basically like, hey, you're chosen, you're saved, and your subsequent life is frozen, that you're dead, that you're cold. Um, and this is a derogatory, horrible term, but this is the, this is the perception of, uh, certainly in the academic world of Christians, this is the, the, this is the perception of a lot of people in Frankfurt, um, um, of this church, of other individuals. So this kills me, though, because when I read the Bible and, and I see how beautiful God's grace is, that there is there very clearly is this we're in we're in this this aspect of Romans right now right the first eleven chapters were how and why you're so broken and and why God's grace is so amazing right now we're like what do you do about it um, so are are we as a church collectively are you individually somebody who is just saved by grace and is just throwing your hands up and not doing anything with your life or are you responding to that? Are you reactive to that grace with all that you have? Um, so I, I do want to... So bef in between stimulus, so there's a stimulus, and there's a response with basically everything in life, right? Um, this is basically the entire world I live in with, with, me with uh, medicine and, and with studying science. But um, if I told you to drop your cup right now. Drop your cup. <clears throat> and if you did it, what is between me telling you to do that and you doing it? Okay. No, no. What's between, what, what occurs between me telling you to do something? Yeah. What's, what, what is, what happens between that, that time period? A decision. And who's in charge of that decision? Okay. So, and this is the difference of denominational thoughts, right? So th there's a decision here. Um, some would call it your will. But, but something happens right here, right, um, in everything in life. And whether or not you believe, I mean, obviously, this, this church talks about God being sovereign over all things, and, and, I, and I wholeheartedly believe that. But there is a component. I mean, does the Bible teach about free will? Yes. Does the Bible teach about election and, and predestination, yes. Um, and again, I'm not, the purpose of me standing here today is not to try to pull those things out. I mean, this is not, I'm not a seminary professor, but, but regardless of where you fall on this, regardless of where the community falls on this or any denomination, there is a decision here. And, and to be empowered to recognize that there is a stimulus and that there is a, a response that you are free to choose. You know, we believe God is the ultimate stimulus, that, that anything that you choose is ultimately first determined by him and, and imposed upon you. So that's where, that's where we say thank you, God, in those situations. But, but I, I, one, of my, one of the things I wholeheartedly want to get across and 
to anybody I'm around in this community is, is how much more we can do as a response or as a result of God's grace. Um, and I hate the term frozen chosen, and unfortunately I agree with it. Um, I look around and I see a massive amount of lack of productivity, collectively, corporately, individually. And, and I look around at our community and I see needs. Um, and I'm not talking about serve Frankfurt days. I'm talking about life lived day in, day out for the sake of other people because you are saved by grace. Um, and it kills me, to be honest with you. So I don't know if you all feel the same way, but this church should be the most productive group of people in the community um, because, of, because of what is taught from the pulpit and because it's real, it's true. Um, so ask yourselves, um, are you frozen? Um, are you a frozen chosen? Are you, are, you, are you being proactive with your decisions as a response to God's grace? So one of the things that's talked about um, in this book that I mentioned is the circle of influence and the circle of concern. I'm going to use the most classic example over the last few years, and that's COVID. Um, how many people in here had an influence over what happened with COVID? <clears throat> so I was the medical director of UK's emergency department over three EDs, biggest emergency departments in the state. Guess how much influence I had over what happened? Zero. Was I incredibly concerned about it? Yes. Um, and, um, and because of that concern and lack of influence, it nearly put me under, as Sarah knows. Um, I wanted to quit medicine. So, but what, there is a circle of influence and a circle of concern. All of us have a circle of influence, and please don't say social media is that influence. Um, what are the areas that you might have some influence in, real influence? Your decisions have impact. Children. That's by far the biggest, right, if you're a parent. What else? What'd you say? Yeah, so, so, yeah, so kids in school. Yeah, so kids in school. <coughs> what else? For me, I have some influence on my business. For my actual practice as a doctor with the patients that are in front of me. That's why I almost never talk to anybody about medicine outside of work because it's like, you don't, you're not my patient. You're not going to listen to me. Um, you know, but when you're paying to show up and you're like, hey, I'm at your, I'm having some issues right now, you know, you largely let the doctor make decisions, right? Um, wh so what, where, where might you have a circ circle of concern where you don't really have influence? Where you don't individually have influence? And w let's talk about some spiritual things here, too. Let's get practical. Government, Absolutely. So, um, anybody in here an elected official? No, even elected officials largely have, have not a lot of influence sometimes, right? Um, what else? Who's concerned about missions? Missions are a great thing. Who has individual influence over missions? I have a reason for saying that in a minute. I'm not saying we shouldn't believe in missions, but how do you have individual influence over missions? We give offerings to missions. Okay, you can individually give. So that's some influence. Do you, have, do you have any idea how the money is spent in AM? Or, yeah, right, but I'm just, it's spent, right? I mean, so there's a little bit of influence there. What else? What's the biggest way you could have an influence on missions if that's something that you have a concern over? Okay. I'm talking about, like, I'm talking about international missions right now. Be a missionary, right? So... Um, one of the things about being proactive is to really recognize where your circle of influence is. And if you really have a true circle of concern, either get rid of it, recognize that you're not influential in that area of concern, or do something about it. So be proactive about your circle of concern. So, you know, I've used the, the two big examples in my career were, you know, fixing the waiting room issues at UK. There were people were dying in the waiting room. That was a circle of concern. And I had the power to fix it. Um, or hepatitis C that is a national epidemic people don't really know about, and I'm trying to fix that. Um, but COVID, I had 
a huge circle of concern, and I recognized very quick, quickly that, that I could do nothing about this, right? Um, I, had, I didn't even have influence in this church or in my school, to be honest with you, um, let alone in my workplace. Um, so, um, so my point, though, is recognize where you have a true influence, and the vast majority of your true influence is at home. Um, where are you indispensable? Um, and, and if you really start to think about where you're indispensable, you'll, you'll start to think about um, where things are important. We'll get to that in a minute. But a truly effective person gets really, really, really focused on the areas of life that are truly important to them that have been inspired through the Holy Spirit, through God, right, in, in your u- unique individual circumstances. Um, so everybody's familiar with Acts 1-8, the scripture. Everybody know that scripture? I'll read it for you real quick. <clears throat> There's a visual up there so to remind you. <clears throat> you will receive the power, receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Um, what, what, was, what was the method of Christ for reaching the world? This is always really interesting for me to think about. Hudson Taylor talks about God's method has been and always will be his people. So God, creator of the universe, who literally spoke the, the universe into being, said this is the method with which I am going to spread the gospel. And what was that method? Twelve. And one of them was terrible, right? He chose 12, right? His method, God's method, creator of the universe, whom we are made in his image and we are to imitate him. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, was a small area of influence um, that had large areas of concentric effects, right? So... It was from the inside out. It wasn't ski ball. Everybody know what ski ball is? It wasn't ski ball where you were like, I'm going to throw a ball into this outer ring. Right? It's, it is, we are effective here now, and that has concentric effects. We are so effective at making disciples that somebody falls so in love with Jesus and is so concerned about the world that God wakes up in them the call to be a missionary, right? Um, And again, I'm not saying don't give money to missions or these things, but I am saying that those types of models lose sight of the intention, um, that that God has called us all to be effective where we are and that that expands. That's what changes communities. It starts here and it grows. Any business-minded person knows that. You don't you don't go take over the world with business overnight. You, you create something that's effective, and you grow it slowly. And that is the church. That is how the church happened. That is how the church worked. That is still the model of the church. And that is the model of discipleship. Um, so in, in years, years past, I taught a class. I taught several classes on work and different things. But um, there's a book that I really like called Creating Culture. Um, it was by the chief editor of Christianity Today. The whole book is about creation. So being proactive really is largely about recognizing that you're a creator. Um, you were made in the image of the great creator. The difference in humanity and everything else that's created is that we create. Um, so one of the first things about being an effective Christian is to recognize there is this gap between a stimulus and a response and that you are are empowered by God to create. Whether that's to create a chair or clean water or lesson plans or a model that eradicates hepatitis C or how to raise small children, like you create. So um, I might come back to some of these other, these other texts. Um, again, I've, I, have, I do have some extensive notes um, Theologically, if you want to, if anybody is interested in this topic, to dive into that, but I probably won't have time today. Um, so this this topic again burdens me, um, and this is me, but.
but, it, but this burdens me because I see, I see needs in this community that are not being met um, with resources that we have on a daily and regular basis. Um, and that should, that should burden us all. Uh, um, yes. Um, so I don't want to be offensive. Um, so I'll just, I'll just, I don't want to, I don't want to offend anyone in particular. And people that are going to listen to this are, I might be offended. Um, that's right. Uh, if I wasn't being after, after class, if you'll come talk to me, um, I'll, I'll give you some examples. Um, but w- w- let me ask you guys, though. I mean, what needs do you see that aren't being met with the resources and the gifts and skills and talents that we have? I mean, a, a very obvious example is discipleship of children. I'll just leave that very very generic. Um, we are losing children. We have lo- anybody who's worked in an academic environment knows that that's true, particularly college. Colleges and universities are 99% filled with kids that are not just not Christians, but in direct opposition to Christ. Very, very few. I mean, I'm at UK though. I mean, that's where I've been. Um, so it's not a, by no means is it a, a place where families that are in churches, you know, primarily choose to send their kids. It's, you know, there's lots of Christians that are there, but it's not a Christian university. Um, but no, I'm saying that there was never to begin with a model or a structure that was expansive and extensive to actually create dis- a, a, a widespread discipleship body of believers of children to begin with. That I mean, we're a, we're a city of 50,000, and how many kids are in our youth group? I'm just using this as an example. Um, I don't know, 50, 50 to 100 maybe, which is actually a pretty good-sized youth group. It does. It does. And the individuals, I mean, and, and, and but, but also the parents, you know, parents, those, these are parents that are sitting, you all are in a Sunday school class right now, Right. So this, this is not the, the group of people that needs to really hear this. But are you responsible for your kids alone? <clears throat> this is one of the reasons why, I mean, and I'm very passionate about this right now because I see this group of girls on the soccer team that I'm coaching, and they are so hungry for discipleship. It's, it is unreal. And I'm not saying their parents aren't doing it, but I am saying that, that they have other people pouring into them. Um, I, in fact, I don't actually know all of their parents. Um, right. I mean, and I'll use an example of two people in this classroom. My kids come to church just because of her. That, I'm, I'm not kidding. That, 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 that is, you know, one of, the, one of the explicit things that they state. And that's not me. You know, again, the people in this classroom are not the people that need to hear this, right? Um, but same thing with Melanie. I mean, in terms of, of her days at CC or, or now at... at at TFCA, that um, that if the church and and everyone within it would really recognize that that your circle of influence is not just your home, but you're in a community of 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 spiritual need, and people in this room I think are meeting that need, um, but but be thinking about where you're influential, and and making sure that you either replicate yourself or or are doing as much as you can with your efforts. That's, that's what I'm talking about. And, and you know, um, how I reach other people outside of just individual interaction and friendships and relationship building, I'm not sure. Um, but, but I do think it starts at home, and, and it's, it's, uh, it, it goes from the inside out. So um, the second one is beginning with the end in mind. Um, I taught a class in the past on remembering death. My, um, I'm not going to go too much into the, the theology behind this, but... Uh, one of the greatest things we can do is to have a, to, one of my friends, Kurt Vernon, used to say, think about what's going to happen 150 years from now. You're gone. Um, you know, lots of people talk about thinking about your funeral, things like this. Um, there's different opinions on whether or not that's good or bad. But um, the story of Lazarus is my favorite. You know, we know Jesus loved Lazarus. 
And they came to him and they said, hey, um, Lazarus, whom you love, he's sick, he's dying. And, and the text says, so he stayed where he was two days longer. And then and he died and Jesus said, I'm glad I wasn't there. It's like, what? Lazarus, whom you love, you stay. It says it, 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 the result of you hearing that is you stay there two days longer. And, and then he's like, I'm glad that I wasn't there. But he says it's for your sake, those of you who are still here. And then immediately after that, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Right? So death is not always bad. Um, and when you think about, there's a book called Remember Death. I would highly recommend it. It's one of the best books I've read in the last 10 years. Uh, Matthew McCullough, he's a Presbyterian preacher down in Tennessee. Very, very, very good book. Um, but remembering death puts in perspective today. Um, you know, count your days. Remember your days. I mean, there's all kinds of texts about this. Again, I've got extensive notes on this that, that wasn't my purpose today. If you all want them, I'll send them to you. But, um, but there's, this, there's a practical component to this, too. So not only should we think about that spiritually, but the practical component. So we talked about you being creators. So beginning with the end in mind, um, let's talk about lesson plans or something that you're producing in your own life. Before you set, up, set on to do something, so there's a stimulus. You've made a decision to do something. The next thing that you do, that, uh, the next thing an effective person does is they make a plan about what that's going to look like. Of course, within the context of James, this is if the Lord wills, if he tarries. Um, um, but, and I, so I'm not saying at all like you're going to say, I'm definitively going to do this, 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 and this. But not planning, not making a list is also ineffective. Um, so can someone give me an example of something they designed before they did it? There should be a million examples in every one of your lives. Whether that is what your house is going to look like after you declutter it or something else. What your marriage is going to look like after you go on dates. What? Yes. And if you didn't design it, what would happen? It would be mass chaos. Is it presumptive? Is it arrogant? Is it unspiritual, unfaithful to not plan? No. Would you say it's irresponsible to not plan? Yeah. Right? So, again, this is where I'm, I love Reformed theology so much. But this is, where, this is where if we become the frozen chosen and we're just like, oh, God is sovereign over all things. God will make things happen. People that say those things live ineffective lives. Um, it's just true. Just practically speaking, it's just true. Um, so everything you do is either by design or by default. Um, in, the, in the UK ER waiting room, just an example. Had I not intervened on the waiting room, we would have by default had four to... Frankfurt has 15-hour wait times right now. Right? I mean, I've talked about that according to some of my friends that have been working there. That's by default because nobody has gone in and designed something different, right? Your kids are going to continue on the path. Um, and again, this, this definitely has some Holy Spirit intervention here. But, but if there's major things, they're going to continue on the path with things you've designed. A good, good example would be soccer, right? To what extent do we choose soccer where there may be games on Sundays? I'm not saying that's, that's one direction or another because I'm a huge fan of soccer. But we have to design Everything that we do in our lives, we have to think about the endpoints of that, and that's going to be a dynamic, a dynamic, dynamic feat. But to, to be able to design something with the end in mind, you must first realize that you're a creator. So you're a creator, now you're a designer, and you're going to think about what the end is going to look like before you get started. And effective people always are like that. Um, and one of the most beautiful things, the creation mandate to fill and subdue the earth um, that, that is one of the very first things God said, be fruitful and multiply. That was the first command that he gave to humanity, um, that we are designed in his image to be creators just like him. Um, and uh, that's a beautiful thing to think about, it, and it's a very freeing and empowering thing to think about as well. Um, you know, our church, our theological stance on that would be anything you designed was first, that, that God was the great stimulus, that, that everything is a result of his gift to you, and your use of that gift. All right, so this is an important thing I want to talk about. Um, let's, before I go there, let's look at this, this graph that I made. Um, so I want you to think about two things, urgency and importance. We're going to talk about four quadrants. 
the top left quadrant is are things that are important and urgent, things that are, oops, I erased non-urgent. Things that are important and non-urgent, things that are urgent and not important, and things that are non-urgent and non-important. Who can list for me something that's urgent and important? Let's say if you're having a heart attack. I've got, it's time limited, that's a crisis, right? Um, what other things? So, okay, so, so gone on a flight. What about a kid that's rebellious in the moment? Like, would you say that's urgent and important? Right? Everything else in your life stops when that happens, right? Same thing with a marriage that's failing or something like that. What else? I know you can't read that. What'd you say? Okay. Okay. Anything else? Urgent and important. What about perception? Things that you perceive as urgent or important that... Talk about... Okay. How would you all summarize all of these things? What, what type of events are these? Life and death. So, um, so, so this is um, the author of this book I'm talking about. So this is, this is the quadrant of crisis. Okay, what about something that's urgent and not important? Something that, that, and maybe you could put something like a bill down here. Right, it's urgent. You got to get it done, but I mean... It could be important eventually. If you don't pay your bills, you're going to get kicked out of your house, get your water turned off. Phone calls. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you just hit the nail on the head in our house. <laughs> what else? <clears throat> Urgent and not important. Turning in homework. So homework. Staff meetings. Staff meetings. Okay. You define important. Think on like even thinking about my table with me could be dead urgent. Uh-huh. So a point that I made in a downstream slide is what we first must know what a win is. So you've got to define for me what is important. Um, so you tell me what's important. Let's, let's say, and here is a, a time to be spiritual as well. I know a lot, of the, a lot of this class I've said, don't give me just the spiritual answer, but salvation is important. Spending time in the Word is important. Is spending time in the Word urgent? Is it, is, will something bad happen if you don't do it? Okay, so I would say spending time in the Word, good point, um, but, but largely spending time in the Word, and there's a reason I'm going to put it in this quadrant, but um, spending time in the Word, I think, is something that I would say is are important but non or it's not, a, it's not a life and death at this moment, eternally, it's life and death. Okay, prayer. What else? So this is non-urgent, but important. What else? Discipleship. What else? I kind of... Yeah. Well, well let's, let's talk about that in just a minute. No, 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 no. I, I, I agree with you. To, but we're defining these things. We're, this is just an, a description of, it's not right or wrong. This is just a description of how to categorize time management type things. Okay. Cleaning house. And this is subjective, right? This is, 
this is uh, how you define it. So I am asking you to define your own important things because there are people that are like, I'm not going to stress out about my house because I'm going to focus on other things, right? But if your house stresses you out, then to you that's important, right? If, if I'm married to somebody who gets stressed out when the, white, when the house is messed up, which I am, then that's important to me. <laughs> So answering emails, where would you put that? Okay, I would put those down here. Would you all agree? It depends on who it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so may, maybe. So if there, there are, so the, the, there's probably both, right? Yeah. You've got junk. Yeah. Like you do have to go through your mail and like, you know, pay your okay. like that is Right. Sure there are important emails. There are non-important emails. There are important phone calls. There are non-important phone calls. Okay, what else? Any type of relationship here, right? Your relationship with your kids, your wife. Um, okay, what, now what about down here? Any of my boys that are in my discipleship group would know the first one I would put down here. Anybody? Video, video games. games. <laughs> video games. I hate video games. TV. What kind of TV? Is, is TV always not important? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So there is some conscience within this, right? I mean, Chris taught a very good class on conscience. If you didn't, if you didn't uh, read that, I would highly recommend it. There is some conscience in here, right? I'm not saying, thus saith the Lord right now. Um, um, what else down here? Vegging out, literally doing nothing. Death scrolling. Well, most of social media, I would say, regardless of any justification, <laughs> most of it. I'm not saying all of it. All right, let me, now let me ask you this. Um, where do you spend most of your time? I've got some of the answers up there, so don't read it. Well, all right. So where do you and where should you? Let's start with where do you spend most of your time? Who's spending a lot of time down here? Anybody? Maybe nobody in this room. Okay. 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 I would... I would put that up. Yeah, no, I mean, if, if you are watching something like a game or something like that, and you're like, this is my rest. And, and if it's truly a function of making you more productive, I w then I would put that in as important. I'm fine with that. I mean, like, I, this is where the conscience comes in, right? Somebody like John Piper is going to say, never watch TV, right? I mean, I'm not going to say that. Um, but I'm going to say the vast majority of TV shows are probably, or any type of binging or, or laziness or lethargy or being a sluggard, if it's for the purpose of productivity, then it's rest. Getting kids to school, what? What, what are we talking about? What did you? Okay, so you spend, so you, well, I mean. So you missed one of my other classes about waste and variation. One of the wastes, and it depends on how you define getting your kids to school, but one of the wastes we defined was movement, and that is just an operational. Um, so any type of, and, um, and you know, I mean, you know, and I totally, 100%, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but like one, this is one of the reasons why we chose to go to school close, right? Literally because I said, all right, like, this, it, it is important to some extent but I'm spending most of my time doing this. And these other things are the things I really want to be doing with my time. So how do I change my decisions to really... So we want to spend our, our life... This is where we need to be spending our time in quadrant two. We want to live a quadrant two life, as the author of this book talks about. People that live in a crisis all the time, I and mean, who knows, I know lots of, particularly ER doctors, lots of people live in a crisis. Like I've always, and I have the last few months been in crisis mode. I've had this, 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 and this, and it's been overcommitment. 
trying to get that to sign that out. But people who live in a crisis mode oftentimes do this too. They, they live in a crisis and their only escape from the world is to do something completely worth, worthless. And then they're doing nothing up here. And then they get 13,000 emails in the hole. Um, and so the goal is how do we read, arrange time management, make the most use of your days and most use of your time because, because let's see, Ephesians 5, 15 through 16, all right, make the best use of your time because the days are evil. Um, how do we, how do we, use our time efficiently. And so what I want you to think about are, are these things. We, we talked about tactics of eliminating waste and variation and how to, how to get the right things on your, on your calendar. Um, a quote that I really like is, don't prioritize your schedule, but schedule your priorities. Um, a, a demonstration of this is, imagine a cup, and I've got, I've got stones, and I put them in the cup. Is, this, is the cup full? If I fill it to the top, is the cup full? No. Okay, I'm going to take some smaller pebbles and fill it in. And did I fill in some holes? Is the cup full now? Okay. And I've got sand, and I'm pouring it in the cup. Is the cup full now? All the way to the top. So I add water. Now is the cup full? So from a time management standpoint, what's the lesson there? The lesson is not keep adding smaller things. But had I not started with the rocks first... They would have never made their way into the cup, right? So these are the rocks. And I have many, 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 many times in my life been guilty of not having time by by my own design to have the rocks in, um, in my cup first because I filled it with sand or water first, and then I was trying to add the, the rocks back later, right? And good examples are our dates with my wife or, or sleep, right? I mean, so other things, other basic pillars of just of sleep, exercise, healthy eating and food preparation. I mean, these types of things are, if they aren't prioritized in your schedule, you will not do them, right? And, and they are very important to be an effective person as long as possible. Um. At 20 minutes. So, so this is where, you know, the, the, this book that was written was not necessarily written for, primarily for Christians. There is, I don't know the guy's background who wrote this book, but, um, but there's, it, it, it does help us frame things in such a way that we can look at what's important and what's not. And um, another book that I really like is called Halftime by Bob Buford. I mentioned that at the beginning of, of the class. Um, he, the guy who wrote this book, he owned a multi-million, multi-billion dollar ca- cable company, and he just felt, but he just felt empty. He wrote the book halftime because he asked himself, what, a, like, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? I built this massively successful business, but I felt empty. And, and his, um, in the second half, he basically just purely went to basically ministry type work. Um, and he wasn't trying to degrade the business work, but he, he interacted with a non-Christian marketing specialist and when he asked these questions, like, what's, what's wrong with me? Why can't I figure this out? And that guy said, I had one, one question for you. What's in your box? You know, with, when you've got a business, um, anybody read the book Good to Great by Jim Collins? It's another leadership, great leadership book. But in that book, it talks about the most successful businesses and what made those businesses successful. And he calls something the, the hedgehog concept. They do one thing really well, and then they grow that. And so this marketing expert asked him, he said, what's in your box? What is the thing that, what is the most important thing in your life? And the spiritual Sunday school answer we're all going to give is Jesus, right? So does your time, your checkbook, your energy, your resources, how you use your life, does it reflect that that is true? Are you living your life here? Or are you doing things that are worthless that, and wasting your life? This is a life not wasted. There are going to be crises. I'm not saying that there's always going to be crises. Um, there, the more we plan up here, the less things down here that happen because we're going to stay on top of our emails. Our house is going to stay clean. 
Um, we're going to be responding to our crises as an overflow of spiritual peace. Um, and these things, I'll get a good example for me, something anybody who knows me knows how much I love golf. I've played golf twice this year. And it's not because I don't love golf any less than I previously loved golf. I just love other things more. Um, I'm a soccer coach now. I never thought in a million years I'd be a soccer coach. But it just displaced golf because, because golf has become less important to me. Um, and, and golf for me has always been a rest. And whenever I have time, I'll go out and hit balls. But, but, uh, um, but, but can we spend more time in this quadrant two, two zone? Um, and this is where the personal mission statement comes in. That's how you define what you said, what's important. I'm like, you define what's important. You've read the Bible. The Holy Spirit lives in you. You get to define what's important in your life. Now, within the context of Scripture, you don't get to say what's important to me is to divorce my wife and go find another wife, right? Like, the, there, are, there are clear things that, that are outside of the bounds of Scripture. But there are so many things within the bounds of Scripture that within, the, within also conscience that you can, you can be like, hey, I'm going to, I mean, so if somebody would sit right in front of me and said, I'm going to send my kids to public school and I'm going to go be a light, my whole family in that public school, and I'm going to pour all of my effort and resources into that. I know families like that. I'm like, fine, go for it. Um, if you're like, I'm going to homeschool to the glory of God, go for it. I'm going to, to pour my whole life into TFCA, go for it. Um, but sitting back and letting the default happen is the opposite, right? It's, we're not going to design something. Kids are important. Kids are up here raising our kids in this community are important. We all have to be um, engaged in that that's an important thing. How are we going to design better processes and projects and structures that support that? Right? So um, the next one is win-win. Um, this one is huge for me um, in business. So um, let me go back. So when, when God says, and I don't think we're going to get through all these today, but when God says to love your neighbor as yourself, is it wrong to love yourself? Have you? So is my pursuit of joy and God's pursuit of his glory, are they independent from one another? Is my pursuit of joy... In God's pursuit of his glory, are they the same? They should be. So, that's right. This is where character, integrity, having, this is what the Bible is for to help us understand how that's true. John Piper, you all know I like John Piper, his entire ministry, his ministry, the name of his ministry is Desiring God. His whole life has been spent tackling this question. Because he hated growing up in the church saying, why do I feel like my pursuit of my joy is independent of God's glory? And his conclusion is they're the same. And his, his summary statement that of, of his whole ministry is God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. So the argument, and anybody who's poured their lives out for other people knows, you get the greatest joy when you pour your life out in other people. That that is how God's designed our hearts and our souls to, to be. So, so everything that you do, it, it, he, he calls it Christian hedonism. It's not wrong to pursue your joy. If your joy is in, is in watching TV shows, um, is in something that's worthless, that's not what we're talking about, right? Um, if your joy is in cheating on your spouse, it's not what I'm talking about. Um, you know, you name it. But what I'm talking about is that, that every, in every avenue in life, and, and in particular business, there is, there should, every situation should be win-win. It's having the abundance mentality that, that, I, that I should always be able to do things that are going to make other people win while I win. Eternally. 100%, right? You can't, you can't live a selfless, servant-like mentality without having a Christian background. I read an article this week about Elon Musk saying that um, video games taught him how to be not empathetic. That, that in, in video games, you, you win. 
and it doesn't matter who loses. And that's how he approaches his business. He's a brilliant mind, right? But, but as a Christian, you're right. Um, the only way to be a true servant and to, to recognize that you exist for the well-being and the good of others is you must trust in God. Yeah, so the, the underlying presupposition here is that I'm talking to the good soil, as we talked about weeks ago, that this is that I'm talking to Christians right now. Um, but absolutely, the, the, there's a, uh, this is not going to be true. I would not teach this to a group of, of uh, secular students in, in the same context. From a business standpoint, it's true, though. Um, and, and I'll give you an example. So this is, this is a slide that I use for my hepatitis C program. So um, there are people out there with a disease that's killing them that, that the, the disease itself costs $20,000 to cure. Every year that we cure somebody, it, it saves insurance companies $25,000 per patient per year because of downstream healthcare costs that are avoided, cirrhosis, liver transplants, and things like that. So, so um, how, anything in business should never be, anybody in here that's in business should never be zero sum. You should always seek to do, for the good. And that, that's true of going and buying a car. I hate hearing stories. I've told you all this of, of Christians that go, and like, look at what I got this car for. I'm like, the, the person who's selling you the car has a family or something they're wanting to do. Like, there's a lot of, like you can, it, there's, a, there's this overlap of what's acceptable to them and acceptable to you, and it benefits you both. Um, and, of course, they generally would never sell you a car where something that is not beneficial, but that, but, uh, but you can do things in your life where each, each individual stakeholder gets value added. Um, so in this particular instance, um, the, the payers and the insurance companies, they save money because we, because we cure a disease. The, the, the patients, obviously, they get a horrible disease that's cured from them. There's all kinds of evidence of, of how that benefits them. Um, the healthcare system gets the drug margin from the federal systems that exist for, we get to purchase the drug at a lower price and then we make money on, it's called 340B, we make money on, on the drug itself. And then it's our pharmaceutical company, we create systems that cure people of disease, use their drug, they make money. So, um, you know, ultimately in healthcare, it's, you know, we're trying to do something, the right thing for the patients, but we've got all these other stakeholders that aren't really going to be involved unless I bring value to them as well. I'm using this as an example of in your life, what can you do that brings value to other people that also brings value to yourself? That's loving your neighbor as yourself. Um, you know, I'm loving coaching soccer right now. It brings value to me. I get to get out there and get to see these kids grow. I get to run and be active with them too. Um, it's not, it's not just, it's not them winning and me losing, right? Um, and each one of those, the getting walked all over and saying, I'm just giving up is that's, that is somebody else winning you losing or saying, I'm going to win at your expense. That's me winning you losing. And then obviously lose, lose is not a good situation just because everybody loses. Um, so two more real quick. This is pretty obvious. Um, seek first to understand and then be understood. Um, we could go into the scripture in James where it talks about being quick to listen, slow to anger, slow to speak. Um, you know, so there is biblical grounds behind this. And um, I'll give Chrissy, my wife, some credit here. Um, I call them Chrissy questions. She is so interested in other people in a way that I've never been able to be, even if I'm intentional about it. She asks 10,000 questions about your life. And sometimes more detail than you could possibly give her, but she's just so interested in you that, that she's always, people have always loved her for that reason, but it's just who she is, um, and she rarely talks about herself, um, and you all know people that just talk about themselves, so those aren't fun people to be around. I mean, so effective people are truly invested in, in other people, um, so understanding other people and where they are, you can't, you can't give them any type of value until you know what they need, um, and um, so that's, that is a, that's talked about quite a bit in this book. And then synergizing, working together, corporate cooperative cooperation, creative cooperation as a, as a corporate entity. Um, you know, this, this is leadership structures. This is interdependence, recognizing you, the body of Christ. There are individual members that all work together that, that serve different purposes that, that collectively are trying to do something together and, and uh, again, you know, this, this for me um, is where I 
where I see, and I'm not talking about Buck Run, but where I see the corporate American, American church failing significantly. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons why that is, but, but, uh, but we should synergize with one another. If, if we are to be truly effective people, we should work together as teams. We should have team players. We have to, should have team roles and we should continually accomplish more, um, and never be okay with, with the status quo. So this last idea is, is what I'm going to end on. And that is the, the PEPC balance as he calls it. Um, the production and the production capabilities. Does everybody know the Aesop's fable of the golden egg? Where the farmer had an, a, a goose that produced the golden egg and he loved the golden egg. Does anybody know what he did with the goose? He said, I'm gonna get all the golden eggs out of this goose and I'm gonna cut it up, right? And he destroyed the goose um, and he didn't get his golden eggs anymore. Um, so with each of your roles, so we talked last week, I think that was last week, about what your roles are. Um, and we can get spiritual, we can get not spiritual here. But let's talk about, let's talk about discipleship real quick. Um, the Great Commission we like to focus on, and, and there's a component of the Great Commission that I think, anytime I talk to anybody about this, that I think is dramatically overlooked. So the Great Commission says, go therefore, go therefore make disciples of all nations, Baptizing them in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What does it say after that? Teaching them what? To observe how to observe some of the things, all things. Does it say go therefore and make converts? It says go make disciples, teaching them to observe all of the things that I've commanded you. What are the implications of teaching somebody all the things I've commanded you? What are the implications of that statement? What does that imply about your knowledge of things that he has commanded? That you had spent time in the word. What does that also imply about the time spent on the thing you're trying to produce? Is it a flash in the pan going for a week mission trip? What is making a disciple teaching them to obey all the things that I've commanded you? What does that imply? A lot of time. A lot of time. Years in years per disciple. How do you maintain that from a productivity standpoint? You're the goose. Your golden egg is a disciple. How do I not tear you up in the process? You need to sleep. You need to rest. You need to exercise. You need to eat healthy. You need to make sure that you are as productive and able to be productive as long as possible so that you can do the most that you can. You've got to take care of yourself. So you're a, you're a saw that he talks about the saw. The saw is only as good as it's sharp, right? There has to be time where I take the saw and I sharpen it. Otherwise, the saw is not useful. Um, let's look at some other capability. In my house, I wanted to produce kids that are that love the lord that were disciples of christ that are that are that eat healthy that have healthy bodies that have strong minds and the number one producer of that in my house is my wife and we were homeschooling she was drowning i was dulling the saw by my design just in our home right so we had to make lots of decisions to get this, this all sharp again, and now she's sharper she's ever been, right? Um, what's some other role? We've got three minutes. Can somebody, this, this hits home for me, um, this, this particular aspect, because once the whole class that we talked about was defining this, figuring out how to, how to get here, and we talked about you know, things in the middle here, like how, how are you more efficient, how are you more effective, but now that we've defined different areas in your own individual life, what things need to be done differently in your life to make sure that the production capacity is maintained? I'm gonna give you one quote real quick. Charles Spurgeon, y'all know Charles Spurgeon is Herschel's favorite theologian, probably mine too. Um, he used to ride first class in trains in the 1800s. And um, somebody, said, uh, somebody said to him, this is in his biography, they said, I don't know why you're riding first class in trains. I'm saving God's money and I'm riding coach. And he just looked at him and he said, 
I'm saving God's servant and riding first class. And this is not me saying you have to go ride first class in planes. I've never been first class in a plane. But, I, but it, it was him saying, this is my rest. This is like me getting rejuvenated. And you're judging what I think is productive. And he's like, nope, I'm going to ride first class because I'm saving God's servant. I love that quote. Um, in your lives, we defined last week your, your golden eggs. What, what things do you all need to do differently to take care of the goose? Yes. Which one? I circled off. <laughs> well, the, the, the non urgent and the non urgent. Yeah, yeah. You're spending most of your time here? So, but That's I good. Like, but I feel like so well, and not even coming from your lens, but like, where is the balance and the fine line between like, because I, I, I was sitting here completely upset, and I was like, oh, like, that's all I do. But I dropped the ball on everything else, but to where I'm like, but how do you do productiveness? No, the the argument is that if you're well, these other things in other classes I talked about just getting rid of other things off your plate. Yeah, this this is I'm saying that people that are effective must be spending time here. You're planning. You're spending time in the Word. You're spending time in relationship building. You are going to be effective with the things that are important. You may be ineffective with the things that are unimportant. That's a whole different discussion, right? And that's okay. I mean, there are things that I willfully choose not to do that other people have asked me to do all the time. Sometimes I tell them that I'm not doing it. Sometimes I don't. Oftentimes I don't tell them. If you're actually spending lots of time here, yeah, this is the whole point. Yeah, you're, then you're spending your time doing the things that, that God has laid on your heart as being important. And that could be... Good point. So, yes. Yeah, and I use the example of when I first married Chrissy, I was spending four, four hours a day in a Bible study. Um, and there came a point where I, that was, for me, that was actually sinful. I mean, not that studying the Bible was sinful, but, you know, if you're doing this instead of taking care of your child, you know what I mean? But you're, you're taking care of your child is also in this in this quadrant, right? I mean, so I'm assuming, but yeah, no, there's a balance of the things within this quadrant. The argument here is not that you spend all of your time here. These other quadrants exist. There will be crises. There will be time. There's no such thing as somebody who's not, um, not wasting any time. I waste time all the time, um, and I try not to, but, um, but the argument here is that is, is, is really more qualitative in the sense that there is no such thing as an effective person who doesn't spend a lot of time in this quadrant. That's really, that's my conclusion here. And it's 1031. You all can leave if you want. So important. And that it's okay to say, hey, I'm important and I need to get up to here for two. Yeah. Like, that that is allowed and that is not an I think I told you C.S. Lewis's quote, which I'm going to use again here, that all jobs exist to support the job that truly matters the most, and that's mothers. Um, so I agree with you. I mean, the, the mom of the unit that God has created to be his method for reaching the world, in my mind, is the golden goose, or is the goose that produces the golden egg. I mean, I think that that is the functional unit of the church is the family, 
in our culture, the mom and the husband administratively does lots of leadership type things. Don't get me wrong. But no, I mean, I, I mean, yes, the goose is, I'm glad. I'm, right. And I think a lot of husbands just haven't taken a step back because I'm sure your husband never, and same with me, like I never ever looked at my wife as not valuable, but I never said, my goodness, I need to do everything with all the resources I have to, to protect you because of what you're producing. Um, all right, I'm going over time. Um, I, I pray that this class has been helpful for you. I hope, and maybe for somebody listening, I hope for someone this motivates them to be more productive for God or that this opens up some new mission in their life. That was my goal of doing this. If somebody will just, if somebody that was affected by this will write me an email, I'll realize I didn't waste all my time. Um, <laughs> I'm zero in my inbox right now. Zero. Zero in my inbox. Yeah. So I am actually applying these things in my life. I realize I told you that, I mean, I, I have been struggling perpetually, but I am, it's, it's a trajectory of improvement. All right, I'm going to pray real quick. We'll get you out of here. Um, dear Heavenly Father, I, I do just love you, and I thank you, God, first of all, that, um, that you sent your son for us. And God, that, that as we talked about weeks ago, that, that there is no such thing uh, as productivity without first resting in your finished work on the cross. Um, God, I also thank you for the people in this church, the amazing people that you've allowed me to meet that I know that are here. God, I know what they're capable of. I know, I know what this community of believers is capable of. And I, I, I honestly, I just pray that you would just ignite a flame in this community um, and that you would allow us, our, our eyes to open, the veils to be pulled from our eyes and for us to see the needs of the community um, and the needs in our home. And I pray that you would give us the strength, the power um, to be equipped uh, and the, the, for the work of ministry, Lord, for what you've called us to here um, and in surrounding communities and throughout the world. God, we love you and pray these things in your son's holy name. Amen.